This week on Vaticano, learn about the escalating Christian persecution in Africa and the Hungarian government's aid efforts. We explore the different saints Pope Francis has canonized over the years. We gather insights from a renowned French philosopher on faith and rationality and experience part one of our journey to the Vatican Museums. Vaticano starts now. Archbishop Paul Gallagher is effectively the Vatican's foreign minister under Pope Francis. In Rome this week, an honor was given to the Archbishop. He was presented with a special peace award for his efforts in trying to end war and conflict and bring about peace throughout the world. The award ceremony was held at the Campidoglio Square. In accepting the award, Archbishop Gallagher spoke about the Vatican's efforts amid the current wars in Ukraine and Israel. L'essenza dell'opera per la pace the essence of work for peace consists not simply in governing processes, but rather in establishing a dialogue with those who each time represent the other. Even more, dare I say, it means creating the conditions so that the other does not appear as an opponent, but as an opposite. After receiving the award, he spoke to EWTN. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm very honored to receive this award, but I obviously received the award uh, on behalf of the Holy See, the Holy Father, and the work that the Holy See has been doing for so long uh, in this area, and which is uh, often it's, it's, it's very modest, but we have to do something. We have to try in, this, in these terrible times that we're living in today. He also spoke about the barriers to obtaining peace in the world today. The problem is that we have to be able to talk to each other. We have to be able to talk to each other with sincerely. I think. And the difficulty is that there is now a lot of pain in the world, a lot of anger in the world, and that doesn't make dialogue very easy. The event was organized by the Ducci Foundation, a cultural and interreligious organization promoting dialogue and understanding. Paolo Ducci is its founder. Monsignor Gallagher, uh, as, uh, in his position of responsible for uh, the, the policy of the, the Vatican, you know, just uh, in the world, uh, of course, uh, is playing a very big role and very essential, I would say, very fundamental role, and I think it's doing very, very well. The event was attended by various ambassadors, showing their support for Archbishop Gallagher's efforts for peace, including the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Joe Donnelly. We see our friends in Ukraine being attacked, um, Hamas attacks Israel, you know, we, we uh, want to stand with Palestinian citizens as well. And to see Monsignor Gallagher um, receive this award, he's been an advocate for peace uh, his whole life. And so uh, it's something we wanted to honor him. Concluding his speech, Archbishop Gallagher said the Vatican's efforts for peace are needed today as much as ever. Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. Some, Some 300 million people are suffering persecution for their Christian faith worldwide. One in five Christians is persecuted in Africa. 89% of the Christians killed for their faith last year, more than 5,000 people, were killed in Nigeria. On Friday, November the 10th, the Hungarian embassy organized a conference in Rome to present the achievements of the Hungary Helps program the Hungarian government's humanitarian assistance program for persecuted Christians and other victims of crises. The conference paid particular attention to the dire situation for Christians in Africa. We here in Europe have a majority Christian um, civilization. We, are, we don't see Christianity being persecuted, but out of 10 people persecuted for their faith, eight are Christians. And as we learned today, a huge part of those killed for their faith are being killed in Africa for their faith. So we want to always remember people that this is not a very fashionable persecution. Other minorities are being persecuted. It's all over the media. Christians, it's like, hmm. Um, Hungary wants to do something concrete, help for that. 
And uh, that's why we believe, as I told you before, the place where most Christians have been killed for their faith is in Africa. So that's why Hungary believes we have to be there, help our brethren, um, help our Christian brethren, but also not only Christians. We help people of all faiths. They all profit from what Hungary does with their uh, institution, Hungary Helps. Archbishop Fortunatus Nwachukwu of Nigeria, the secretary of the section of first evangelization for the Dicastery for Evangelization, thanked Hungary for aiding Christians worldwide. Hungary is contributing to the improvement of ties between Africa and the West. I wish to thank His Excellency, your government and your people for your approach in your humanitarian assistance, getting involved the local communities knowing their sensitivities, knowing their cultures, knowing their needs, and not trying to impose any new ideologies on them. This is Fratelli Tutti. On the sidelines of the conference, Tristan Osbej, Hungary's state secretary for the aid of persecuted Christians, met with Davide Dionisi, the Italian special envoy for the protection of religious freedom, Italy and Hungary highlighted their commitment to ensuring religious freedom around the world. Hello and welcome to this week's Vatican Updates, the most important news from Pope Francis and the Vatican. Critically ill British eight-month-year-old infant Indy Gregory died overnight on November 13th after her life support was removed over the weekend following a UK court order. In a statement released through Christian Concern, Gregory's parents said they are angry, heartbroken and ashamed. After England's High Court ruled that it was in the child's best interests, to be taken off life support against her parents' wishes, the Italian government granted the critically ill child Italian citizenship on November 6, and agreed to cover the cost of her medical treatment at the Vatican's pediatric hospital, Bambina Gesù. Gregory's parents repeatedly appealed in UK courts to be able to take their baby to Rome for treatment, but lost their legal battle. Pope Francis has relieved Bishop Joseph Strickland from his duties in the Diocese of Tyler, Texas and appointed an apostolic administrator to replace him. Strickland's removal on November 11th comes after the Texas bishop refused a Vatican request for him to submit his resignation two days prior, according to Cardinal Daniel Di Denardo of Houston. The Vatican Dicastery for Bishops completed a formal investigation in the Diocese of Tyler early this year, called for an apostolic visitation. A group of Benedictine nuns from Argentina will soon take up residence in the Vatican's monastery where Pope Benedict XVI lived after resigning the papacy. The Benedictine Order of the Abbey of St. Scholastica of Victoria, located in the province of Buenos Aires, accepted Pope Francis's invitation to form a monastic community in Mater Ecclesia Monastery. The six nuns will move into the monastery which is located in the Vatican Gardens in Vatican City State in early January, according to the Vatican. The Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith has said an adult who identifies as transgender can receive the sacrament of baptism under the same conditions as any adult, as long as there is no risk of causing scandal or confusion to other Catholics. The Vatican also said that children or adolescents experiencing tr transgender identity issues may also receive baptism if well prepared and willing. The guidance comes amid ongoing discussions within the Catholic Church about the pastoral care for the so-called LGBTQ community. The mother of a hostage held by a Palestinian terror group, Hamas, has expressed thanks to Pope Francis for his efforts to free the hundreds of innocent people who were abducted from Israel on October 7th. In a video released by Vatican News, Rachel goldberg Polin, whose 23-year-old son, Hirsch goldberg Polin, was kidnapped, said, Holy Father, thank you for taking the time to help us free the 240 human beings who are buried alive under Gaza. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. I'm Matthew Santucci for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano.
Since Pope Francis was elected Pope, he has canonized several people almost every year. Men and women, old and young, people from different eras and social backgrounds. What most of them have in common, however, is that they all stood up for the poor, for those on the margins of society. This is fitting for a pontiff who sees himself as a pope for the periphery. On May the 12th, 2013, barely two months after his election as Pope, Pope Francis carried out his first canonizations. In addition to two Latin American religious sisters, Laura Montoya and Maria Guadalupe Garcia Savala, the Holy Father also canonized Antonio Primaldo and his 800 companions, who were martyred in the Ottoman invasion of the Italian city of Otranto in 1480. Since then, about 100 other saints have been added. In 2014, Francis canonized two of his predecessors. One was John XXIII, who was elected Pope in 1958. During his four and a half year pontificate, he convened the Second Vatican Council. In the presence of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, Pope Francis also canonized John Paul II, who led the church into the new millennium. In 2018, Francis canonized another of his predecessors, Pope Paul VI. During his visit to the U.S. in 2015, Francis canonized Junipero Serra Ferrer in Washington, D.C. The Spanish Franciscan priest came to what is now California in 1749, founded mission stations, and spread the gospel in America. One woman whose deeds speak for themselves is Mother Teresa. The nun dedicated her life to the poorest of the poor in the slums of Calcutta. The Order of the Missionaries of Charity, founded by her, continues Mother Teresa's work. As Archbishop of San Salvador, Oscar Romero demanded social justice and opposed the military dictatorship of the time. Romero was shot by a death squad in 1980 while preaching in church. Pope Francis canonized him in 2018. One year later, the Holy Father canonized John Henry Newman. Newman was a member of the Anglican Church of England. He converted to the Catholic Church despite much hostility. He died in 1890 and continues to influence generations of theologians today. Charles de Foucault also has had a great impact up to the present day. The Frenchman led a dissolute life before he underwent a profound conversion and moved to the African desert to become a hermit. He was shot dead in the Sahara on December the 1st, 1916 by Bedouin marauders. Charles de Foucault, who had never founded a monastery himself, served as an inspiration to other founders of religious orders. He was canonized by Pope Francis in 2022. It is possible that Pope Francis will soon canonize a teenager as well. Carlo Acutis died of leukemia at the age of 15. A devout Catholic, he used the internet by the early 2000s. At the age of 11, he created a website with an online directory of Eucharistic miracles. Whether man or woman, young or old, fearless martyr or silent servant of the Lord, Pope Francis reminded the church that every person has the same vocation, the vocation to holiness. The vast plurality of American teenagers claim to be searching for God and meaning. According to the most recent Pew Research poll, 63% of American teens are Christian, with 24% identifying as Catholic. Unfortunately, recently, many surveys and studies have stated that young people frequently cite intellectual reasons when asked what has prompted them to leave the church or lose confidence in it. Chief among these are the convictions that religion is opposed to science or that it cannot stand up to rational scrutiny. These concerns are crucial stumbling blocks to the acceptance of the faith among young people. French philosopher and theologian Jean-Luc Marion, member of the prestigious Académie Française, has claimed that these fears are misguided and echoes St. Augustine's thesis that if you can comprehend it, 
then it is not God. La difficulté, c'est que nous ne comprenons pas. The difficulty is that we do not understand what it means to understand or to know. God is absolutely unknowable. That's what St. Augustine meant when he said that if we think we can know God like a worldly thing, we are mistaken. Descartes also expressed a similar idea, and I believe that all serious philosophers have said the same. The problem is that we can know without understanding, and there is no paradox in that. The best example is intersubjective knowledge, knowing someone else, in a sense. Not only is it not understanding them, but it is realizing that if we did understand them, we would not have a fundamental interest in them. If I can understand the other person, they become an object. Why do people love animals? Because they can understand them. But if one loves someone specifically, they know them without necessarily understanding them. And that's why we can continue to love them. Well, it's the same for God. Et bien pour Dieu, c'est pareil. In Rome, on November the 8th, at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, a public lecture was held by Ratzinger Prize winner, Professor Jean-Luc Marion. The lecture, titled Going Around Metaphysics, was organized by the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture. Professor Marion addressed how we can access the sacramentality of the world and help the students and youth be drawn into the Christian story. The question of Christianity is that we do not seek. In the church, we do not seek Christianity. One becomes a Christian when one feels that they are sought by Christ. The problem is that we do not have to go shopping in the spirituality market, which is the current trend. There is a market, and Christianity is one of the products. Well, the Christian experience is not about buying spirituality, as one buys behavior or a car. It is the experience that through the church, directly or indirectly outside the church, one is called and wanted by Christ. So it's very different from the spirituality market. The spirituality market is always a question of personal comfort. People want personal development. Why not, even if they believe they have no soul? Why not buy religious culture, a religious orientation, as there are sexual orientations? That's not the question at all. The question is whether Christ has called me. That's it. La question, la question c'est de savoir si le Christ euh, m'a appelé. Our current era places a premium on individualism and goes against the gospel message of not my will, but thy will be done. Professor Marion sees the world as having always been this way and that one should have more hope. Mais le monde, mais le monde a toujours été individuel. But the world has always been individual. We imagine too much that our world is an exception. There are laws of the world, the laws of the world, of organized selfishness, of individualism, everyone for themselves. Finally, we are invited to the banquet by the great king, but we have business to attend to. We have our trade to conduct, and so on. Therefore, I do not believe that our century is absolutely unprecedented. The most powerful follow the same rules. That is to say, God is not important to them. That's why when God comes into the world, he is poorly received. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. The Sistine Chapel and the Vatican Museums cause all to lift their spirit and contemplate the relationship between God and man. 
he speaks to each person individually. Into a chosen number, he instills a specific call, not only to appreciate, but to make a special effort to keep the beauty before them alive and afresh. Works of art and rare antiquities throughout the rooms, chapels, galleries, and courtyards inside the museums are seen by millions of visitors every year. But beyond the public eye and behind closed doors are those pieces temporarily under restoration in spaces where the fragile works can be healed and cared for. These are the restoration laboratories inside the Vatican Museums. Here, behind the scenes, restorers commit themselves day in and day out for months and even years to multiple or sometimes just a single work of art. Across the museums, the needs are nearly endless. An estimated 20,000 works are on display out of approximately 70,000 cultural artifacts, many of which need constant restoration. Ensuring that these needs are met are the Patrons of the Arts of the Vatican Museums, an organization founded in 1983 celebrating its 40th anniversary. It has an office in Vatican City and nonprofit chapters spread across the globe. We have chapters in Asia, North America, Europe, many, many places. And uh, it's an international group of people, patrons, who come together for the main purpose of preserving and conserving the museums in their ability to help the restorers, preserve the works, so the rest of their generations to come can enjoy these works and look at them and say, this is part of our civilization. Before the patron's founding, Pope St. Paul VI laid the groundwork in 1969 by calling together an international group of benefactors called the Friends of the Vatican Museums. Their purpose was to purchase modern art and bring it to the Vatican Museums. And from this point forward, new ideas began to spring forth. There was an understanding that the museums needed to preserve and restore the art that's already there. And so this was the founding, the name change, to Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums. To mark the occasion, the Patrons of the Arts of the Vatican Museums held their 40th anniversary celebration at the Vatican from the 6th to the 10th of November, with chapter members in attendance from across the globe. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful, wonderful beginning of the week of the 40th anniversary of the Patrons. The panel consisted of key figures from the Vatican and its museums that included Sister Raffaella Petrini, Secretary General of the Vatican City State, Dr. Barbara Yatta, Director of the Vatican Museums, and Cardinal Fernando Verges Arzaga, President of the Vatican City State. To celebrate this great anniversary brings back many memories for everyone, but it is also a renewal, a time for the awareness of our important mission, the preservation of beauty that is so beneficial for all humanity. We personally thank you today from our hearts for the good that you do and wish for you and your families the best wishes of peace. May God bless you. For the next four weeks on Vaticano, we accompany the patrons of the arts of the Vatican Museums, showing you key moments during their five-day pilgrimage in the Eternal City and giving you a rare look at life inside the restoration laboratories and projects of the Vatican Museums.